This session will focus on the emerging leadership challenges in a rapidly evolving operational environment and how military personnel training will have to cope with new technologies and threats to win future wars. The session is chaired by Lieutenant General A.K. Singh, PVSM, AVSM, SM, BSM, retired. General A.K. Singh is the former Lieutenant Governor of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands and Puducherry. He is the ex-GOCNC Southern Command as an, and is an alumnus of Staff College, Campbell, UK and Milinovsky Tank Academy, Moscow. He is one of the few officers to have trained with both the NATO and the Warsaw Pact at the height of the Cold War. The General has commanded the 7th Cavalry, a T-90 Brigade, an Armoured Division and the most powerful Strike One Corps. Presently, he is an independent director and advisor with various institutions, including OP General Global University. The General has co-edited two books recently, The Military Strategy for India in the 21st Century and Battle Ready for the 21st Century. General A.K. Singh will be delivering a talk on the crisis management and escalation control. The first speaker on the panel is Lieutenant General Arun Kumar Sani, PVSM, UYSM, SM, BSM, retired. General Arun Kumar Sani, superannuated as Commander-in-Chief of an Army Command on India's Western Borders. Earlier, he commanded the Indian Army's largest corps in the Northeast, deployed along the LSE with China. He was a recipient of the Sword of Honor and President's Gold Medal on commissioning for standing first in order of merit. He trained for a year with the British Army and was a military diplomat in Russia for three years. He is a distinguished fellow with two premier think tanks in Delhi, CLAWS and the USI, and is on the Board of Governors of India Foundation. General Sani will be speaking on leadership challenges in 21st century operational environment. Our second speaker for the session is Dr. Mary Bell, who is joining us from the US. We thank, we thank Dr. Bell for speaking at the event despite the inconvenient time difference. Dr. Bell has over 20 years of service in the US Army with experience in aviation and intelligence. She flew the UH-60 Black Hawk helicopter in South Korea, Hawaii, throughout the US and in Haiti in support of operational uphold democracy. She also flew the C-12 Huron and EO-5B airborne reconnaissance low aircraft to support Operation Palmetto Ghost and Palmetto Shield. Dr. Bell is the faculty chair of the Joint Advanced Warfighting Schools Operational Art and Campaign Planning course. She holds a PhD in International Studies from Old Dominion University. Dr. Bell will be speaking on leadership quotient and training as a winning factor in wars. I will now request the chair to take over the proceedings of the session. A very warm welcome to my co-panelists and the audience who are logged in for session four of the Pragyan Conclave 2022. In this session, we will cover two critical aspects. My erstwhile colleague and very formidable CNC General Arun Sani and a distinguished speaker from the US, Dr. Mary Bell from the Joint Advanced Warfighting School will talk of various facets of military leadership. But before that, I will speak on a rather offbeat topic, crisis management and escalation control using an India-Pakistan case study. Well, let me begin. Within a span of two decades, 1999 to 2020, India and Pakistan have clashed seriously on at least four occasions, along with uh, numerous minor flare-ups. The latest was the terrorist strike at Pulwama, Jammu and Kashmir, which resulted in 40 casualties to Indian security forces on 14 February 2019, and India's counter strike at Balakot, deep inside Pakistan, on 26 February. Two nuclear-armed adversaries engaging in air combat is as dangerous as it can get. With China too, despite robust mechanism in place, we have the current standoff in Ladakh. Against a nuclear backdrop, it is imperative for the political leadership, the diplomats and the armed forces of all three countries to come to some common understanding of crisis management and escalation control so that we don't drift 
into an unintended conflict with China despite broken trust and tense face-offs. At least we are talking at multiple levels. However, with Pakistan, the danger gets multiplied due to lack of communication and brinkmanship. During this short talk, I will analyze the Balakot crisis to draw some inferences and lessons. So start with defining and understanding escalation control. Escalation as related to conflict is a relatively new word and was not found in the dictionary till 1961. Whenever there is armed conflict and there is an increased stroke upsurge in the scope, intensity or spread of that conflict, it can be termed escalation. This could be a calculated move by one or both parties and more often an unintended consequence or miscalculation. The most established work on the subject is by Herman Kahn, a renowned political scientist and geostrategist in the US, whose seminal work titled On Escalation is the basic reading on the subject. However, in the subcontinental context, there has been a dearth of any serious study, though two works of Stephen Cohen stand out. First, Nuclear Proliferation in South Asia, the Prospect of Arms Control, and the second, Four Crises and a Peace Process 2007. Therefore, I chose to study the subject and write on this in a book that I co-edited for Clause Battle Ready for the 21st Century, published in Delhi in February 21. A quick look at the escalation matrix. The escalation ladder or matrix is the way in which the severity of conflict grows step by step. Herman Kahn's 16-step escalation ladder is often criticized as a Western view which in the Cold War context reflects a one-step-at-a-time escalation, which may prove altogether inadequate in many situations existing in the 21st century, like many simmering disputes which move up and down the escalatory ladder, for example, the ongoing proxy war in Jammu and Kashmir. This logical explanation of the escalatory ladder may also prove inadequate against an irrational adversary like North Korea or Taliban. Therefore, strategic and operational leaders should retain the flexibility to deal with unexpected situations imaginatively rather than with preconceived notions. The key players in a conflict. While there are many stakeholders in a conflict, the key players would always remain the political, the diplomatic, and the military. The political level remains the highest level at which major decisions regarding any conflict will be taken with reference to prevention, initiation, escalation, and de-escalation. Of course, such decisions will often take into account the diplomatic and military advice tendered by experts. It is therefore necessary for the diplomats and military leaders alike to be in sync with the political authority and where necessary speak truth to power. A study of the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 should be recommended reading for all those charged with taking key decisions in a crisis. Herman Kahn, while analyzing the superpower rivalry, tensions and crisis also states that private communication, either direct or indirect, through principles or intermediaries, or through the use of more or less deliberately arranged leaks, all play an important role. The ongoing crisis in Ukraine is another case worth studying, though it is still evolving. There are deeper motives on both sides than appear on the surface. Whilst escalation dominance thus far has remained firmly in President Putin's control, it's now getting a bit complicated. 
China remains the hidden player, as are the major European nations vis-à-vis -vis USA, and Ukraine is caught right in the middle. In the short time available, I will just present some conclusions and recommendations with reference to India, Pakistan, and China. Foreign conflict has become very unpredictable and destructive in the 21st century, especially between nuclear-armed adversaries. In such a dangerous scenario, the focus should be on conflict prevention as also resolution of conflicts before they escalate beyond a point of no return. With both Pakistan and China, India has underlying causes which have defied resolution since the last seven decades. We thought mistakenly, as it turns out, that we had reached some understanding with China, but that trust stands shattered by recent incidents. Let's be clear. Peace can only return when the basic contradictions are resolved, and there seems to be no sign of this at present. Self-restraint to localize the conflict. At Kargil 1999 and Balakot 2019, both India and Pakistan exercised self-restraint to localize the conflicts. And let me give you an example. After India's counteroffensive in Kargil, there was no commensurate retaliation by Pakistan in the form of using their air force or other means. Similarly, India was constrained by the political authority not to cross the line of control, which actually caused a larger number of casualties, but did restrict the scope of the conflict. At Balakot, India was very careful in selecting the target at Balakot deep inside Pakistan, but away from Pakistan's air defense network and thus minimizing the chances of an air combat. Similarly, when Pakistan retaliated on 27th February, India chose not to escalate further. Another good uh, sign was when uh, Wing Commander Abhinandan was made a POW he was returned promptly within a week, maybe because of international pressure or Indian threats. This portends well and can be built upon to control escalation in any future crisis. However, such crises cannot be always fine-tuned. What if Pakistan had intercepted the Indian airstrikes on 26th? What if India had intercepted the Pakistani retaliatory strikes on 27th, I think the consequences would have been severe. Channels of communication. Whilst multiple channels remained open during the Kargil conflict and helped contain it, during the Pulwama Balakot crisis, such channels were generally absent, which could prove dangerous in any further standoff. We need to not only build on existing channels, but also work on opening other channels, such as at the level of the national security advisors, foreign secretaries, to avoid the possibility of a catastrophic misunderstanding. Channels between core commanders could also be opened, but all such channels work on a certain amount of trust, which is conspicuous by its absence. Military dialogue. I think and I'm convinced that a military dialogue needs to be started between India and Pakistan. And you can see the contradictions. The Indian political hierarchy is not very comfortable dealing with the Pak military, who calls the shots on all strategic issues within Pakistan. The United States understands this and therefore their lead player to talk to Pakistan is CNC Central Command. Way back in 2008-9, when I was the Director General in Perspective Planning, I had floated a note on this subject to say that a military dialogue needs to be started soonest. It found no takers that time and was consigned <laughs> into some corner of a desk. 
But I think the time has come for the militaries to realize the serious consequences of often on crisis brewing between two nuclear neighbors. Third party intervention. Despite their stated position, especially in the case of India, that we do not want a third party intervention, both countries, India and Pakistan, have turned to United States to defuse the crisis, be it Kargil, be it Op Parakram, be it the Mumbai terrorist strikes, and even the latest at Balako. The USA was able to play this role as they were encouraged by most key players like European Union, Russia, and China. This equation may not so exist in the future, and both countries cannot bank on this and should therefore develop crisis management and escalation control mechanisms with greater dispatch. And lastly, coming to the nuclear backdrop. CBMs in the nuclear field is a vast subject and hasn't really got the attention between India, Pakistan, China. The mismatch between the Indian and Pakistani nuclear doctrines is indeed worrisome. The Pakistani doctrine is opaque with very unverified red lines. What add to this the introduction of tactical nuclear weapons by Pakistan and merging this with war fighting doctrine and strategy. A detailed seminar by Claus on this very critical subject was held in 2018 and those interested could actually reach that. Whilst there are some rudimentary nuclear CBMs in place between India and Pakistan, for example, exchange, annual exchange of list of nuclear facilities and agreement not to attack each other's nuclear facilities. In addition, advanced notification in respect of ballistic and missile tests, moratorium on further nuclear tests and pre-notification of military excises. However, China doesn't even discuss nuclear CBMs with India to deny India any legitimacy as a nuclear power. There is much scope for enhancing CBMs of the following type. Firstly, greater transparency in Pakistan's nuclear doctrine is a must if we are to avoid any catastrophic misunderstanding. Transparency in dual use of missiles, especially with China, who has thousands of missiles with this dual use integrity of mechanisms and personnel handling nuclear weapons to prevent them from falling into unauthorized hands, especially in the turmoil present in Pakistan. Limiting number of nuclear weapons and their delivery means, especially SRBMs and tactical nuclear weapons. Greater safety and transparency in readiness status, including stage-wise upgradation. What is needed is a dialogue mechanism between the three countries specific to nuclear CBMs. We owe it to our people to reduce risk of accidental use. In conclusion, I would state that there is a lack of trust between India and Pakistan, mainly due to Pakistan's duplicity. This has brought the countries to high-risk conflict situations on a number of occasions in the last few decades. Today, however, the battle lines are more firmly drawn, with India having called out Pakistan's nuclear bluff and reclaiming the space for con conventional retribution. The nuances of crisis management and escal escalation control need greater attention and focus despite a lack of trust between the three nations, India, Pakistan, and China. Maybe clause under its new director can organize their next seminar on such a vital subject. Thank you, Jai Hind. May I now invite General Arun Sani to deliver his talk, please. A respected Chair, uh, Director Claus, ladies and gentlemen, those in the physical and the uh, I would say virtual domain, 
and my co-panelists. An absolute pleasure and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to come and speak at this very, very important conclave. Uh, I think after an exhilarating uh, inaugural session by the three chiefs where we heard them speak uh, and the discussion till, till now, I think the issues related to contours of future wars and countermeasures have really been addressed reasonably comprehensively. But I think the most and the most critical factor in any future war remains the military leadership. And I think the capacity and capability of military leadership will be critical for the final outcome of any conflict. I think in the next about 15 minutes, I'll try and quickly cover the nuances. As you're aware, this is a subject which all of us are, uh, I would say, are ingrained right from the time we start our training at the academies and have views which are very, very uh, profound in their own sense based on your experiential knowledge. So I'll try and cover the critical issues as fast as possible to basically flag those which I think need to be given due attention. So in the next about uh, 10 to 12 minutes, I'll quickly talk about what has changed, the impact of that change, and how do we meet these challenges. I think the first aspect of geostrategic reality has been spoken well. Earlier, it has been decided, but I think the rise of China, changing of the economic center of gravity, the strategic uh, competition between the US, China have all created these new organizations like Quad, AUKUS and other such uh, multilateral organizations. And these, the impact of these will have an influence the shape and type of future conflicts. So I think the next generation of leadership will have to be a little more aware a little more understanding to be able to understand the bigger picture and see where you really plug in. So this would be a very critical factor that would have to be looked at in your own uh, development of your own competencies and attributes as military leaders. When we look at the threat landscape, a lot has been talked about. Uh, so I would just state that threats have increased in scale, diversity and complexity. In addition to the legacy threats of territorial and ideological differences, especially in the case of India, where we have boundary disputes and there is collusivity of our two uh, neighbors in any conflict that might emanate with us, we see that the militarization of cyber and space, the rise coming in of disruptive technology or new age technologies, emergence of non-state actors as a permanency in the battle space, the rising social inequality, scarcity of critical resources and the impact of climate change has really clouded the threat landscape. It has, it warrants changes in organization and transformation, a lot of it which was spoken by the three chiefs yesterday to address these new realities. And also, as was stated by the chief of army staff yesterday, I think the military leadership will have to define for itself in this new age conflict, its notion of victory, and that will have to be achieved and stated. We next have the character of war, which has undergone change. I think the impact of technology leaves no doubt in what happened in the previous session, uh, where he talked about where technology is fueling changes today in the methodology of warfare instead of the other way around till the earlier industrial revolutions. So in this particular case, I think greater lethality, longer ranges and pinpoint accuracy has created and given cause greater destruction value on the battle space, requiring a change in the methodology of conducting your ops and your doctrines. When we look at the ICT revolution, I think undoubtedly it has fueled these uh, plethora of technologies, which has changed the capabilities of weapon platforms. It has changed the methodology of data processing. And we now have what we talked about, innovative, disruptive weapon systems on the battlefield how to deal with these from swarm domes to loiter munitions to armed UAVs to robots and autonomous weapon systems. I think simultaneously the increased transparency of the battlefield because of technology, because of high-end sensors, advanced surveillance devices, utilization of the space domain for this particular activity has all created and given you the capacity to have real-time intelligence so how do you harness this real-time intelligence is where we have gone in for network enablement or network centricity, as was talked about earlier. And this is an area which has also changed 
we need the skills to be able to tackle this and to function in this space. And as I said, very soon we had talked about what was said. You've got advanced center, uh, sensors coming in the cognitive domain. You have quantum communication and all these will again further change. So there is the technology is carrying out rapid change in the methodology of military hardware and that military hardware's employment and its impact will have to be dealt by the future military leadership. Militarization of, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the, uh, uh, sorry, before I go back to that, just a quick word on the cyber and space domain. Uh, a lot has been spoken on cyber warfare, but I think undoubtedly this linkages of the governance, public utility services, and the security aspects because of the digital medium has created new vulnerabilities and also given you new leverages. So it depends on how you expose it. But I think what it has done is that battle space is no longer restricted to the military dimension, but includes non-military domains. You can achieve your political objectives without physical contact, and there is a diffusion in the battle space. It is no longer restricted to a geographical area, but is an all-out capability of engagement all across the sectors within the nation at various different points which can impact the security of the country. When we look at space, I think it's been spoken about. Uh, India is still a little uh, new to the game. Uh, we have gone in and utilized it for civil purposes, but I think military satellites, looking at our ISR assets, communication facilities, the radius of action of certain amount of UAVs that we have, the new concept of low Earth orbited satellites which will impact the communication and the surveillance base are all issues that the, our adversaries seem to have, especially the northern adversary in a larger manner. And this challenge of using these, countering these, is where the leadership will have to look at. And I think the other aspect that really comes out, which is the most critical, is the issue of influence operations. I think advancement in internet and web-based applications have led to free flow of information and mushrooming of innumerable media and social networking sites. This engagement between people and reaching each other uh, in, in literally nanoseconds to each other and share information has created an outreach which can be played or is being utilized for misuse, either by state elements or by non-state actors. Uh, we have enough cases where we've heard about how the U.S. elections were sort of, to a certain extent, uh, influenced by this domain as far as the Russians are concerned. But what it brings out is that new fake news, manipulated reportage of events, doctored videos and messages, all tailored to a narrative, will have to be countered by this new military leadership to ensure how to tackle this, your counter narratives will have to be in place. I think the last aspect in this is the non-state actors. And I think the primacy of non-state actors in the battlefield requires no questioning as far as India is concerned. We've been battling the proxy war for years. But I think the issue that comes out is that from this non-contact warfare, the, getting the irregulars coming in, getting the non-state actors played, you have come into this situation of hybrid warfare and these new elements which can keep operations below the threshold of uh, outright war. And so we need to know, be able to be more effective. We haven't been able to design effective measures. So maybe there is a lot of scope to use technology to be able to tackle these challenges further. The next issue is on societal transformation, undoubtedly. I think societal transformation has created the change in the manpower that is coming in. Instead of a rural base, you've got an urban, semi-urban. You've got an educated, a much softer soldier. How do you train them? How do you equip them? How do you motivate him? How do you do all these activities is the issue. And as when you come to the military leadership issue, I think the military leadership issue, we know what are the salient changes that are happening between when we talk about the generation X, Y, and Z. Z. Post millennials today are digital natives. They need to function in a different manner. Their local characteristics and character qualities are different. These have to be harnessed by the organization to ensure that you have effective leadership. Uh, as I just talked about it, the complexity of problems have gone up. As, as more and more areas of militarization come in, as more and more players come into the security domain, the complexity of problem has gone, requires military leaders to be adapted, changing and addressing. And lastly, the perceptual change in professional and personal ethics is a matter of concern. This needs to be looked at with great amount of criticality and uh, in a very, very innovative manner be addressed. What is the impact? I think undoubtedly what has been stated, multi-domain operations, 
uh, future conflicts will be full spectrum. How do you deal with this kind of a milieu in the battlefield? The technological revolution, whether it's the legacy system, whether it's a disruptive technology, or whether it is network enablement, has changed the manner of conducting decision making and implementing action on ground. So the capacity to be ahead on the learning curve will always have to be there with the future military leadership. Because of the devastating power of the new weapon systems, mobility, survivability, these have gained credence and more importance in the battlefield and will have to be looked at in your capability development as you go ahead or capacity enhancement. When we look at the issues of warfare, I think whether it's the limited warfare, uh, which would be limited in space or in time, uh, is, is a reality in the conventional and kinetic domain. But you have these non-contact gray zone operations gaining more and more amount of credence, how to tackle those, how to deal with those in simultaneity, in isolation or in a hybrid environment is the question that remains. Manipulative strategies, as I said, is the challenge today for all of us. Should not force the leadership to take decision making under an emotional hype created by this fervor on the manipulative narratives floating on the social media and various other uh, related media sites and platforms. I think the cross domain awareness, and this is where I talked about in the geopolitical reality, you will have to understand today, like when you went into CI operations, you looked at understanding how the local administration and how the local police forces function. Well, I think in the same lane, you will have to now start looking at how different nations operate. If you're going to be looking at joint operations, whether in the HADR, whether it's in the uh, maritime domain where you are involved, or you're looking at joint training and capacity building with like-minded forces and resources. India's growing stature demands this capacity to be able to uh, be inculcated in the future leadership. I think the changing workforce and relevant adaptation, I think this is the biggest change. There is a change in the work culture, in the caliber and the uh, characteristics of people who are coming in. How do you harness the best out of them? Correct HR policies, correct activities will have to be looked at. And I think more importantly, which is the transparency of the media, the social platforms has led to greater accountability and scrutiny of military activities. So it is in this realm that you find that there is a shortening in the space or the levels of war, which would be between the tactical, operational and the strategic. Tactical actions can have strategic ramification. We have Ladakh, we have the proxy war. We have so many cases that you can look at into history to see this is. Then this diffusion creates a decision, uh, it shortens the UDA loop, creates problems for the decision maker. And that's where I think harnessing of technology to assist in decision making and rapid dissemination is the answer for the future leadership. How do you meet the challenge? There is a need for increased attention towards basic military attributes. That doesn't change. But however, the professional military education will have to be looked at more critically as far as the, uh, will have to be looked at more, uh, I would say with greater elasticity to ensure that it actually meets the challenges of today's battlefield. Uh, the next issue that I would talk about is a technological mindset. I think undoubtedly there is a need to be able to understand and harness your capacity to deal with technology and the changes will have to be there. So this self-education, getting in military technology as a subject itself was revolutionary. Maybe we need to do something more to ensure that the levels of understanding of these new age technologies is there at the basic level with every soldier. When I say every soldier, every military leader at the relevant level to be able to take it ahead. The other issue is increased domain specialization. I think the general staff will have to get used to the idea that there is Domain specialization and specialists will have to be given their place in space in your decision making cycle. Otherwise, you may not be able to take the correct decision or a more balanced and rational decision. I think dynamic and relevant HR policies are, are policies how to deal with the future leaders, uh, how to keep the manpower which is trained uh, captive to the organization, motivated to be able to look at next level. Ours is a pyramidical structure. It, it has its challenges. So we need to see how we can keep them relevant. So I think it requires a totally different mindset in the functioning of HR policies. Uh, Risk-taking, uh, sorry, emotional intelligence. I think EI has gained in strength in this new age tech, uh, era of manpower, both at the soldiers level and at the junior and the mid level and the senior leadership. I think this is an area which will have to be given risk-taking appetite. And I think most importantly, the change mind 
change mindset, that is change management capabilities. If there are new organizations that have to come up, new structures, new policies, new doctrines, new thinking, well, then this change has to be transited in a smooth manner. You remain relevant and potent. You remain relevant during the transition and you remain potent at the end of the story. And I think the last issue that I would like to say, it's a continuous learning curve, skilling, reskilling. And that's where I think we will have to start looking at even in our military leadership. And with this, I conclude by stating that though India, Indian Army is the most, or the Indian Armed Forces are the most capable, credible, and well-led organization, it is the pride of our nation, but there is no scope for complacency with these rapidly changing dimensions and spectrum in the war, in the, uh, in the arena of warfare. So I think you and I will have to remain one step ahead. We'll have to ensure that our military leadership is up to the challenge to be able to fight and carry out this task with relevance and remain, uh, well, meet the aspirations of the future India. With that, thank you very much. May I request Dr. Mary Bell to please deliver her address, which is keenly awaited here. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon from the Atlantic coast of the United States. Thank you for inviting me to be a member of this distinguished panel. As you can imagine, presenting from the other side of the world poses extra challenges. I appreciate your patience as I work to counter the fog in my brain at this early hour. I am familiar with various types of fog, meteorological and professional. As you heard in my introduction, I spent 20 years in the US Army flying different types of missions in multiple different types of aircraft around the world from the Korean Peninsula, spanning all 11 of Russia's time zones through the Middle East and across much of Europe. I have flown in the Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere, and in aircraft from nations such as Sweden, France, Romania, and Russia. Something I have never done is present at a conference at two o'clock in the morning. It is an entirely new type of fog for me. A type of fog I am more familiar with is the discussion that permeates military education. The discussion revolves around the notions of training versus education. And the fog manifests as the two advocates often talk past one another. As an operator turned scholar, this is a debate with, it, with which I am quite familiar. Basic levels of training have occurred since militaries have been fighting, but when did education become a relevant discussion? As the question relates to the US military, I found information dating back to the US Revolutionary War in 1778. The nation's founding father, George Washington, directed his army chaplains, religious guides embedded in the ranks, to teach the soldiers to read. Perhaps surprisingly, he made the order not to improve their performance as a soldier, but to improve their quality of life. Although he likely recognized that literacy would improve their perspectives, their attitudes, and therefore, it would improve their ability to perform their duties. In the midst of the training versus education discussion, it is right to recognize there is a difference between training and education in the military. Understanding the importance of the distinction requires defining the purpose of militaries. The United States Department of Defense's Joint Publication 1 is the capstone publication for all U.S. joint doctrine, and it defines military power as the integration with other instruments of national power to advance and defend U.S. values, interests, and objectives. Only when military power is combined with diplomatic, informational, and economic power are we able to achieve our objectives. General Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, stated that we serve for our children. If the sole purpose of the military is not merely to be destructive, to break things and kill people, but to advance and defend interests and objectives, making the world a better place for our children, 
then the question naturally follows, what does the military need to do to effectively integrate with the other instruments of national power? And to the topic of the moment, how does the application of training and education allow military actions to create positive operational and strategic effects? According to author Daniel Burris, the definition of training is that it is task oriented. Training is skills based. You train someone to do something in a specific way for a specific purpose. You can train someone to increase their proficiency, but you get what you put into it. Some examples of training you are likely familiar with, learning how to disassemble and assemble a rifle, learning how to hit a target, learning how to create an effective PowerPoint slide your boss can use to absorb information, how to effectively use a spreadsheet to capture data, training to run faster or longer, learning how to survive when your aircraft is shot down. A person who is only trained but not educated may get faster or better hit a target, but they are unlikely to find a new and better way to do something or find a novel use for the same skill. Because training has a skill-based focus, it does not provide the depth needed for creative problem solving and innovation. On the other hand, Barris defines education is something that is concept-based. Education is learning to see the big picture of why and how things work together. Education is a form of learning like training, but education encourages people to think, analyze, evaluate, interpret, or synthesize information and apply creative thought to form an argument, solve a problem, or reach a conclusion. Some examples of education you are likely familiar with are learning about theories of war, learning what Sun Tzu or Carl von Clausewitz or Julio de Hay thought about the relationship between politics and military power or how to best apply military power to create a desired effect, learning about the art of war, learning how Chinese Chairman Mao saw the world, learning how international relation theories attempt to explain how nations and national leaders think about the world, learning what happened during World War II and how we can learn from it. Education includes thinking and understanding diverse cultures and how to perceive a situation from multiple perspectives. Training is narrowly focused and education is widely focused. Authors Keim and Anderson in a 1997 monograph write that the U.S. Founding Fathers considered it important to provide both training and education. The idea that the military personnel are trained only to kill became increasingly anachronistic in the late 20th century. The lines formerly drawn between those who need education and those who need training have become blurred, if not irrelevant. Education without training has been correctly understood as folly. The military must come to grips with the fact that we cannot train the uneducated and the educated need the grounding of training. Yet despite the obvious practical necessity, the debate about the importance of both training and education rages on. Let's use a metaphor to try and better understand. In the military, we prize health and fitness. If I were to ask you, is it more important for a soldier to have better endurance or more strength? How would you answer endurance versus strength? The real question should be, what is one without the other? It seems a bit obvious. A physically fit soldier must have both endurance and strength. A soldier with only strength won't last a protracted conflict. A soldier with only endurance may last the duration of a conflict that may not have the strength required for specific moments. Both capabilities are necessary for true fitness. I will never forget when I served on the U.S. Army's three-core targeting cell for a series of exercises. 
One of the soldiers who worked for me was a bodybuilder. He won many competitions and worked hard to display beautifully developed muscles. One night I asked him to help me lift and move some heavy equipment and he told me, these muscles are looking at for looking at, they are not for working. We chuckled, but he meant it. His body was pure form and not function. Here was this seemingly precisely sculpted physique who was unwilling, if not incapable, of doing real work. He had what appeared to be strength, but it wasn't useful as it translated to creating enduring power. Balancing endurance and strength, like balancing training and education, shows the interdependent requirement for generating power. Balanced endurance and strength in physical fitness lead to physical power. Balanced training and education in the military lead to combat power. If I am only trained to do certain tasks, then I lack the education necessary to employ those tasks in a way that creates power. If I am only educated on theory and history, then I lack the specific training to necessarily apply that knowledge to something to accomplish it. Our thought processes should not be training versus education. Our thought process should be training plus education, education plus training. These equal the military's ability to create an operational and strategic effect. Consider the paradigm of training and education in terms of escalation dynamics. In my hypothetical scenario, there are three officers. Officer A is well-trained. Officer B is well-educated. Officer C has an appropriate balance of training and education. In my fictional example, there is an escalatory situation on the border between the U.S. and Mexico. A drug cartel is operating on the U.S. southern border and cartel operatives are escalating the level of violence, violence to increase their ability to traffic drugs and people into the United States. Officer A, the one who is only trained, sees her response options as rather binary. She can either lead her soldiers to use all weapons at their disposal to defeat the enemy, or she can cede the initiative and allow the cartel operators to conduct their cross-border operations. In this situation, the officer does not have the education she needs to understand the ramifications of her decisions. She does not have the concept of how to make a decision to support the board broader concepts related to escalation management. She lacks power because she has limited ideas and options. Remember, power is not merely destructive. Officer B, the only one who is educated, is thinking about what the theorists would do. If he thinks about how to apply the concepts of theorists such as von Moltke, Mitchell, Galula, or Trenkir, then he is thinking about how to mass effects. The problem is he does not have the necessary training to translate those theories into action. He does not have all the tools he needs to create an operational or strategic effect that escalates or de-escalates appropriately. He does not have the right training to make a decision and translate it into action to support the broader concepts related to escalation management. He lacks power because he lacks the knowledge of how to organize people to achieve it. Officer C, the one who has both training and education, knows how to employ their soldiers to best create an environment to manage the escalating situation. Officer C can combine their training with their education and move out of the theoretical environment. They understand how to leverage their military forces to change the situation to achieve an operational and strategic objective. Their education allows them to, to envision and recognize opportunities. Their training offers them organization and interpersonal conduits to direct and achieve that vision. They have power because they have both ideas and the physical instruments to impl implement those ideas. 
Yesterday, as I was walking through the halls after students and faculty recently interacted with staff members from Congress, two major think tanks based in the US, the Office of the Secretary of Defense and the Joint Staff, two of our international students from the United Arab Emirates and Serbia stopped me to tell me how the education they are receiving in the Joint Advanced Warfighting School, or JAWS, where I teach, is changing their lives and perspectives in ways they never could have imagined. These two colonels are exceptionally well-trained and incredibly brilliant, but they had not been exposed to the military education at the master's degree level. They told me that the most important thing they have learned in JAWS is not what to think, but how to think. They told me they see the world anew. Though called by different names, soldiers across militaries are required to undergo fitness reports and fitness evaluations. A truly, truly fit soldier has the perspective of education and the training of the organization. The fit soldier can draw from history and theory to think through options, then implement their decision through the ranks, wielding the force as an instrument appropriate to the context. Looking like a soldier is not enough. Wearing the uniform is not enough. Good grooming and good physique is not enough. Likewise, thinking big thoughts is not enough. Reality has a way of puncturing the dreams of idealists. Managing escalation in the 21st century is more complex than ever before. Competition and conflict can go awry in more ways, more quickly than in previous eras. A soldier must be grounded in the fundamentals, which means better training and greater education. Training to know what can be done and having the skill to do it. Education to understand the adversary and the, to conceive of the options. Manning escalation requires both training and education to avoid being a force of destruction and to achieve the interests of a nation. In conclusion, a nation can have the most advanced military equipment, but unless that equipment is employed by military personnel who have the right balance of training and education, then that nation will not be able to effectively create combat power, which combined with diplomatic information and economic power will advance and defend that nation's values, interests, and objectives. Thank you. Well, uh... We come to the Q&A, and the first question I pose is to Dr. Mary Bell. Um, can you hear me at 2 o'clock in the morning? Right. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you very much. So, Dr. Bell, in a similar address to our gathering, we had General Petrus who spoke to us. And during his uh, address, he highlighted uh, the importance of university education and how in his career he actually gave up a very important professionally, professional military course to go to the university. So would you put this in perspective? <coughs> Thank you for the question. It's always a question of balance and Understanding this is where that training and education comes important. So this post where he could create great effects, if he doesn't have it founded in that knowledge and the, uh, the ability to apply those skills founded in a solid education, if you can't go and study and learn the strategic perspectives, what are our, what is the, what do the theorists say? What is what the theories of war? Uh, all of these these topics brought up er, in er, the earlier speakers. If you don't have that right balance and don't understand that the character of war uh, is changing because of technology, and if you can't ground yourselves in those ideas, then the ability to lead is going to be um, hindered. And uh, it's very clear that he understood that that the the value of that balance and how important it is to to be grounded in the education to add to the skill set that he already had thank you dr bell uh, here's a question to general sani and um, dr bell could also pitch in after he's covered it the question is can the dependency 
on the machine systems be a boon or bane in the tactical domain operations? Is human machine teaming, wherein leadership plays an important role, become imperative in the 21st century? How do you see technological disruptions and how they will impact the responsibility, risk assessment, and decision making? Talsani, yours. So thank you very much. I think a very, very good question. Uh, may I just uh, very simplistically answer this bit? It's, it's, it requires a lot of detailed analysis if one wants to give a more profound answer. But what I would say is that the role and uh, the role of the military leader, uh, though remains in the intangible domain, is very critical for the final outcome. Uh, I think uh, there's a great movie that we all would have seen, Eyes in the Sky, uh, where that final decision had to be made whether you go in to do with that, un with that armed UAV, do you hit that target or you accept the collateral damage or do you knock out the terrorist who's supposed to be there. I think finally it was the man behind the machine who had to take that decision. So I think irrespective of the fact of the inundation of technological aids that would come in while carrying out and executing your task, the role of the leader will still remain profound. And that is where I said his capacities to be able to absorb would come in as I think very beautifully articulated with my co-panelist. It's just not on training, but on education. The basic foundation of education will allow him to tackle and harness this to be able to effectively implement the task. Dr. Bell, would you like to add to this? Okay. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, it, it is a really important question and it, it's, it's a tricky environment. So we uh, referenced, so you referenced uh, space and cyber, and we have all this technology. But one thing that we have to be aware of, uh, you you mentioned it. Is it an advantage? Is it an opportunity, or is it a problem? And if we become too reliant on the technology then we can't operate in an environment where those technologies are degraded. And we have to be able to do both. So we need our military to be able to effectively operate that advanced technology, but they also have to be able to effectively operate when that technology is degraded. Um, as you said, there's a, a so much into that question, whether it's at, at identifying risk, risk assessment, or decisions. Uh, it, it, it's a it's a tricky balance, but uh, understanding that both is necessary. We have had several accidents, uh, and in the United States military, where the technology, uh, the the operators of the technology didn't completely understand the uses of that technology, and that can create a threat for us. But then also the degradation of it uh, is also a threat. Thank you. Yeah. Um... There are a couple of more questions, but I'm combining the gist, and this is both to Jaransani and to Dr. Bell. Uh, and it is more pertinent to the Indian context. You see, technologies, especially niche technologies, disruptive technologies, are absorbed at the operational and strategic levels faster. But they're trickled down to the tactical level while it may be more effective in the American context, in the Indian context, I think there is a time lag between the technologies being introduced at the higher level and them trickling down to the lower level. I think something needs to be done about that. May I have your views, please? Uh, thank you. I think it's another great question that has come out and I think that's the biggest challenge today for India. Uh, if I had to just draw your attention to the time that we were youngsters, uh, we, we, we were uh, of a generation who never saw computers that came out. And as we grew up in service, a lot of us harnessed it reasonably well to be able to do what we were executing. And a large number actually avoided touching base. The good part that is happening is that irrespective of the high technology I, uh, that would be utilized in creating a platform, the soldier, once he's trained well, will be able to exploit it optimally within the domains of the training norms. It is the leadership that has the biggest challenge. I think the leadership to be able to absorb 
Just to give you an idea, the reason why I flagged it in that societal transformation was that Gen Z today is a digital native. He understands and looks at algorithms and all these things as second nature. He doesn't have to be told what it is. But for people of our generation, yes, it has to be. So I think what is the, how do you address this challenge where you've got the millennials who are now today at the mid-level executives in the army, that is at the colonel's level and above, You've got the Gen Z, which is the younger lot, and you've still got a senior lot, which is closer to the Gen X, if not going closer to the baby boomers itself. So I think we've got a problem in the mindset. So I think, how do you balance this out? I think technical, uh, technological threshold will have to be raised. When I say it has to be raised, it's not by teaching military tech. I think today from the academy onwards, like we've seen what has happened in the Navy, the Navy has gone the other way around. Because it says it's platform centric, anybody who has to join as a leader in the armed for in the Navy has to be a tech qualified gentleman. He has to have done B tech, which is changing. Whereas in the army, we've come to the conclusion we require a balance. So please add it at your NDA and other levels itself, where the basic elementary subjectivity and theory of these technologies is taught. There are projects done so that he understands how this theory is converted into practical. He doesn't have to be the expert to do it, but I think his harnessing and understanding of it will have to be at a basic level. And this will have to be added at all course levels as you go up the escalatory thing. Continuous learning and a technological mindset, I think that will happen as there is development in India. We will get more and more comfortable with these areas. But I think as of now, our training curriculum has to ensure the right balance of training and education, which was highlighted so beautifully by my co-panelists. Dr. Bell, some views, and here's another question which you could dilate on. Why should modern militaries not want to foster a diversity of opinion and argument by including civilian world from its education? And why does it make sense to involve professional civilian educators in a fashion which limits their capacity to shape the curriculum? So it's about uh, what mix of the military and the civil educators we need? I think you could cover this, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, it, it absolutely is critical. I'm sure you're very aware. So the Department of Defense in the United States is massive. But when you look at the size of the Department of State or the Department of Treasury, uh, these other elements of national power that we say are so incredibly critical, uh, they're, they're so small um, by comparison. In our program, we do have civilians in our, in our program. And so they're coming to our university to become uh, more educated in how the Department of Defense works and thinks. Uh, we do also send Department of Defense officers to similar education opportunities in those other universities. That balance has to be there. So whenever you, you look at uh, the fact that the military, a professional military, it, it, is, it works for the civilian leadership. And if the civilian leadership doesn't understand how to best employ the military, that's a problem. But if the professional military doesn't understand how to best support the political leadership, that is also a problem. Uh, it comes back to that almost that same conversation of training and education, which is if there's not a balance, then one, you're not going to be able to create those effects. You know, I talked about the different instruments of national power. And if you can't combine all of those effectively, you are not going to be able to, uh, to achieve what you want as far as advancing your nation's interests. Thank you, Dr. Bell. The next question was addressed to me. And it was, I read out the question that I mentioned the military dialogue, which needs to be initiated the sooner the better with Pakistan. In India, the one who presses the button is the political class. So in your views, to have military dialogue, especially with Pakistan, will it be possible to have a dialogue excluding the political class? No, sir. Uh, I didn't mean that the dialogue between the two militaries should be exclusive of the political class. The political class will drive the overall agenda of relations between the two countries. And it is the military to military dialogue who can be free and frank to sort out the issues that occur on the ground or to get rid of any misconceptions which the other party may be harboring, especially in the case of Pakistan. So I think 
the military dialogue will be under the overarching umbrella of the political dialogue or the political strategic direction. But I think it is a instrument that India and Pakistan have not tried out as yet. Whereas the Americans have the civil dialogue, the political dialogue, but their main dialogue is led by the central command. And because they find it easier to talk to the Pakistani military in the language that they understand, I think the Indian army would be able to convey some misconceptions and clear it from their mind. Well, I'll, since there is five minutes left, I will introduce a very different question and subject. And this is to both my co-panelists and maybe even the director, Klaus, if he wants to say something. In my talk, I had used a word for both the diplomatic core and the military leadership. The ability to be able to speak truth to power. I think this has become critical across the globe in the 21st century. Because if you do not do that, then I think you will land up into some unintended consequences. So may I start by asking Dr. Mary Bell to lead on it, followed by Dr. Arun Sani, short answers, and I'll ask the Director Claus to say something. Please go ahead. Thank you. Yes, if the military leadership doesn't feel empowered to be able to speak the truth while also supporting the, the political agenda, right, you do have to have both. You have to have that nested. If you're speaking officially for the, for the, in our case, the Department of Defense or the Ministry of Defense, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you have to be able to support that political agenda. And if you are not able to speak and have, and, and the, the leadership is not empowering you to speak and do what you have been educated and trained to do, then that's a problem. And I'll keep my comments short. Thank you. Uh, uh, it's a, a great point that you've talked about, truth to power. Uh, Post-retirement, I'm now operating in the corporate world also. And I find the biggest challenge that the armed forces or the man in uniform has is that he he's used to speaking in a language which is not appreciated and understood by the large amount of people who deal outside. So this harmony between the diplomatic and military, where you're speaking truth and conveying it and how it is perceived at that level is where I find a lot of times in India there is a dichotomy. The reason why I'm saying is, that today when you look at and speak to what is happening in Ladakh, what uh, say the core commander said and what was the inputs given by the diplomatic uh, joint secretary who was along with it, you will find there is a difference in the nuance of how it is said. I operated as the uh, regional border conference with Myanmar where I had a foreign office guy and I functioned myself as the leader of that team. There was a difference in the nuance. So I think the biggest problem in India today is that the awareness of how the army functions and what it states and the uh, impact of that or the uh, urgency of that is, is not appreciated and felt in the thing. So I think this cross-domain training and knowledge which we requirement, not only from the armed forces to be able to speak that language, but also for the people who are there today at the political apex level to be able to understand this is where the slight gap exists as far as India is concerned. Uh, it, to a great account, has been discounted in other armies because of the kind of relationship and development that has happened. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, before I ask Director Claus to say a few words, I am reminded of an incident uh, last year when the President of the United States, if I am not wrong, made a mention that we will bombard 40 cultural sites in the Iranian nation. To this, the chairman of their um, chiefs, Mark Milley, General Mark Milley, when asked by a reporter, answered that the United States Armed Forces follow the laws of war. What a beautiful answer he gave uh, without getting into argument with his boss. I mean, he said what the United States military stood for. Uh, may I request the director to say a few words on this very critical subject? I think it's a very good question that you posed. In my view, a lot depends on the confidence level that is developed between the leader and the led. Unless we develop that kind of confidence, you'll find that 
unless you develop that kind of confidence between the leader and the led, this will continue to remain ambiguous. As we grow in service, I think it's every, very important, particularly in the operational areas, that we ought to have that kind of confidence in our next senior or the next to next senior to be able to say the truth, which actually sometimes tends to get a backseat. Second aspect that needs to be seen is a cross-domain transparency. That means between the military and the diplomatic or the political leadership, there's a tendency to hold back information that is available to the uh, specialist or, on that particular field. So I think it is better that we maintain that kind of transparency and mutual trust between these, but that is not easy to come by. So I think it is going to be something that we need to work together and develop that kind of confidence to be able to be say to be able to say something in a most objective and fair manner. Well, that brings us to the end of this session, and I want to start by thanking Dr. Mary Bell uh, for being up at 2 a.m. in the United States to be part of this discussion. And on behalf of CLAWS, the present and future directors, I promise you a lovely dinner and coffee whenever you visit India. Thank you very much for sharing your very candid views. Uh, many thanks to General Sani, who, as always, is very, very clear and articulate in his views. And maybe there was a time when I had to suffer those views. Whether I liked it or not, we were colleagues together in one of the operational formations. Thank and you. Thank you, Chair. Ladies and gentlemen, may we have a round of applause for the Chair and panelists.